Hi, Dr. Marcus here. When skiers hit the backcountry, they dream of clear skies and fresh powder. But did you know that those are also prime conditions for an avalanche? So what am I doing here? Well, a wave is a lot like an avalanche. In an avalanche, you want to do the same thing you do in the water. Stay on the surface and try to keep from being pulled under. Simply put, you're swimming for your life. But if you do get covered by snow, what you want to do is... Wait, let me show you. This is what it's like to get buried in an avalanche. Now, before the snow packed, I shook my head vigorously to make an air pocket. Now, I've only got between 20 and 30 minutes of oxygen. So I'm going to stay calm and not hyperventilate. But if you get disoriented, I'll spit. The saliva flows down, therefore, that direction is up. In this case, I wasn't buried that deep, but avalanches are no joke. So don't take chances. To learn more about avalanche safety, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. It's clear and sunny today, and I'm 15 miles from the ocean, so why am I worried about this? Because the next time it rains, this bottle is going on quite a journey. It starts here and goes through miles of storm drains. And look at all this stuff. The plastic bags, oil cans, plastic bottles. After the next big rain, it's all going to get swept away. It all ends up here. These plastic bottles can last up to a thousand years. And this, to a sea turtle, looks like a jellyfish that they love to eat. But if they consume this, they can choke to death. This is a sample of the ocean surface from a thousand miles offshore. Plastics may break up, but they never break down. The good news is, Scientists are developing a whole new generation of plastics called biopolymers. They're made from plants, like this bag made from corn. It's 100% biodegradable. But that still leaves millions of traditional plastic bags and bottles. So don't let it end up here. Put this stuff where it belongs. To learn more about biopolymers, visit weather.com slash commando. The next time you want to strike up a conversation about the weather, talk to a cricket. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. About to add Cricket Whisperer to my resume. What's that? Scattered showers? High pressure system? OK, they don't know all that. But crickets can tell us the temperature. Here's how to do it. Just count the chirps of the cricket for 15 seconds, then add 40 to the total. I counted 28 chirps. Right now it's 70 degrees in here. The crickets say 68. It's not bad. A scientist came up with this formula in 1897. Now it works because a cricket's metabolism speeds up when it gets warmer. But below 55 degrees, they don't chirp at all. Now not all insects are as friendly as crickets. So if you're going to be outdoors, here's a way to gauge how bad the bugs will be. Many insects thrive under moist conditions. So compare the current year's weather to the historical average. A wet spring and a cool summer are ideal breeding conditions. So if you're planning a trip, do a little research. Because who wants to be the main course in the bug buffet? To learn more about insects and weather, go to weather.com slash commando.
Hi, Dr. Marcus here. When you break down in the city, it's an inconvenience. But what would you do if you broke down in the desert? The first decision you have to make is whether or not to stay with your car. If you're on a desolate road and you think you're close to civilization, you might be tempted to walk. But how close are you? I can see the town from here. It doesn't look too far away, but it's actually a five mile walk. And it's 97 degrees out here. That's why you should keep a survival kit in your car. Just a few basic items could save your life. You should have a hat, sunscreen, sunglasses, but the most important item is water. If you're walking, leave a note saying who you are, when you left, and where you're going. After you've walked for a while, you might be tempted to sit and rest, but don't. The sand absorbs and radiates heat. The temperature down here on the ground can be up to 30 degrees hotter than the temperature right here. So if you can't find shade, keep going. To learn more about survival kits, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. I'm in Joshua Tree National Park in Southern California. Now up here at 5,000 feet, it can be between seven and 10 degrees cooler than down there on the desert floor. While this whole area is a desert climate, the lower temperatures here on this ledge create what's called a microclimate. And you can find several microclimates right in your own backyard. Trees, walls, your soil, even your neighbor's pool can create different microclimates, and that determines what you can plant. So let's map it out. This measures temperature and humidity, and this probe measures soil moisture. Take readings in several places at different times of the day. And test your soil moisture after it rains. This patio averages four degrees warmer and 3% drier than the garden below. Once you map out your microclimates, you may find that plants that don't normally thrive in your region will feel right at home. To learn more about microclimates, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, I'm Dr. Marcus here with the weather report. It's warm and dry out here in front of my nose, but conditions are quite different down by my feet. To know what plants will thrive in your garden, you need to know the weather conditions under the ground. Just adding food and water isn't enough. If your soil is too sandy, even when it rains, your plants will be dying of thirst. If the pH isn't right, the roots won't absorb nutrients from the soil but you don't have to do an expensive soil analysis. Just grab some moist dirt and rub it between your fingers. Sand is gritty, silt is smooth, and clay is sticky. If your soil is too sandy, it won't hold water. On the other hand, a heavy clay soil traps moisture, which can suffocate the roots. Another important thing you should know about your soil is the pH level, and a simple pH tester can tell you that. pH is a measure of how acidic or alkaline your soil is. You can also change the texture or pH of your soil by adding amendments. For example, this compost can make this acidic soil more neutral. Just like some people are allergic to certain kinds of foods, plants are no different in what they can absorb. One plant's feast is another plant's famine. So do your garden a favor and find out what's going on under the ground. To learn more about soil amendments, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here, enjoying one of my favorite hobbies, sailing. Out here, you want to keep a watchful eye on the weather, 
because you don't want to get caught in a lightning storm. If you're in a small boat and a lightning storm is approaching, you should get to dry land quickly. But a storm can move faster than a sailboat, and this mast can make an excellent lightning rod. If lightning does hit, these wires, even a wet rope, can deliver a deadly shock. Luckily, it's not hard to reduce lightning danger. The mast should be grounded to a copper base plate that's below the waterline. That way, any electrical charge is dissipated. Just reaching dry land doesn't mean you're out of danger. The safest place to be is in a building with grounded plumbing and electrical wiring. If the building is struck, the pipes and wires will send the electrical charge into the ground. So tents, carports, sheds, and picnic shelters are not good places to go. If there isn't a safe building nearby, get into your car, roll up the windows, and don't touch metal surfaces. Check your local forecast to see if it's safe to be outside. And here's some other things to watch for. Large rising cumulus clouds often mean a thunderstorm is developing. And once they darken and become anvil shaped, the storm is already in progress. The best way to stay safe during a lightning storm is to be prepared. To learn more about lightning safety, visit weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. Even when you're out enjoying nature, it's hard to leave the high-tech world behind. And why should you? Whoa. You never know what you'll run into, so it's always good to have a cell phone. And you'll want to get a picture of that awesome view. But if you get caught in the rain, all of your expensive gear could get ruined. You can buy waterproof housings for your electronics. But I want to know how well they work. OK. I've got my cell phone and my camera in waterproof cases. And they say you can swim with your MP3 player in one of these. Okay, let's get wet. Well, I'm certainly soaked to the skin. Let's get my gear did. Camera works fine. Music didn't die. Hello? Can't talk now. It all works as well as it ever did. So don't take chances. A little weatherproofing can keep your high-tech equipment high and dry. For more information on waterproofing your high-tech gear, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. I made this raft out of 800 plastic bottles, and I'm navigating down the Southern California coast. Believe it or not, this raft can sail for hundreds of miles, but I do need to watch out for dangerous winds and currents. And sailors aren't the only ones who need to be cautious. Did you know 80% of beach rescues involve swimmers getting caught in rip currents? You may have heard them referred to as rip tides, but they're not tides at all. A rip current is a powerful channel of water flowing away from shore. Rip currents can be caused when waves hit the beach at different speeds. This results in a band of water that rushes back out to sea. Let's see if I can find one. Sometimes rip currents are visible as brown or frothy water. If you get caught in one, don't fight it. Remember, a rip current is a band of water. So don't swim against it. Swim across it, parallel to the shore. When you're free of the rip current, you can swim back to shore safely. Storms can make rip currents stronger, but they can form anytime, anywhere, even in lakes. So before you dive in the water, make sure you know what you're getting into. To learn more about rip currents, go to weather.com slash commando.
Hi, Dr. Marcus here. When the mercury climbs, there's nothing like hitting the beach. But before you go in the water, think about what you're wearing. Underwater, jewelry gleams just like the scales on the fish. And to a shark, this looks just like this. Sharks are attracted to contrasting colors, so wear a swimsuit that's close to your skin tone. And if you're thinking, I'll skip the suit, well, you better not have tan lines, because that makes you look just as tasty. And when you step in the water, watch out for rays. I'm not talking about the sun, I'm talking about stingrays. They burrow under the sand, and if you step on one, they'll live up to their name. Announce your arrival by doing the stingray shuffle. It goes like this. Step, wiggle, step, wiggle, step, wiggle. The vibrations you make will scare them away. So take a few simple precautions and you'll have a great day at the beach. To learn more about beach safety, go to weather.com slash commando. With perfect skin conditions like this, it's tempting to stay outside all day. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. Being outside in temperatures hovering around freezing can become dangerous if your body uses up its store of energy. When your body is losing heat faster than you can produce it, and your body temperature falls below normal, that's called hypothermia. Key warning signs are shivering and poor coordination. If this happens, your extremities are in the most danger. Putting your hands under your armpits is a quick way to warm them. Even cupping your hands and blowing on them can also reheat an affected area. To stop stiff patches from forming on your face, wrinkle it, moving your muscles around in every direction. Apply heat from another person's body to your neck or inside your wrists, places where the blood is near the surface and will carry the heat through the body. Another good source of heat to carry with you whenever you head out into the cold is a chemical hand warmer. If you don't get warmed in time, you could get frostbite when areas of skin and flesh freeze. The first symptoms are a pins and needles sensation followed by numbness. Frostbitten skin has a hard, waxy appearance and often has no feeling. Should this happen to you, don't rub the numb area. Rubbing a frostbitten area can cause more damage. Quickly seek shelter and remove any wet clothing. Immerse the affected area in warm water. Using hot water or direct heat can damage the skin. You need to rewarm the body gradually and seek medical attention as soon as you are able. For more cold weather tips, go to weather.com slash commando. Dr. Marcus here. Cross country skiing, one of the best ways to enjoy winter snow. But what happens if the weather takes a turn for the worst and you're unable to make it back home? If you get stranded or lost, your first step for surviving overnight is finding shelter to protect yourself from the wind. If you're in woods where the drifts are deep, removing the snow from under a big tree like this is a quick way to create shelter. Even if you're out in the open, you can dig out a protective cave from a large pack of snow. A one-person space should be about three feet wide by seven feet long and just high enough for comfort, usually about three feet. To stay dry, line the sleeping area with tree branches about three to four inches thick. Cover the door with branches, debris, bark, whatever's available. For ventilation, punch a hole through the roof. And as a signal for help, leave something bright outside your shelter. Stay warm and hydrated, then head out when the weather clears. 
For more tips on cold weather survival, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. What do you do if your car breaks down or gets stuck in a drift, leaving you stranded in the snow? Hopefully you're carrying a few emergency items, like a shovel, warm clothing, dried foods, and a lighter or waterproof matches. It's important to stay warm, so put on your hat, since as much as 50% of your body heat escapes through your head. You also need to protect your face and eyes. Snow is highly reflective, so even in winter, you can get burned, even become snow blind. If you're not sure whether to stay in your car, ask yourself this question. Is there help nearby? If you don't know, don't go. And to help search or spot your vehicle, be as visible as possible. Brush the snow off your car and display anything reflective or brightly colored. While you're stranded, you'll need to keep warm while the temperature drops. If the engine will start, you can run the heat for 10 minutes every hour. To avoid carbon monoxide poisoning, make sure the tailpipe isn't blocked with snow and crack the windows when the engine is running. Even if you don't have warm clothes, check out what's in your car. This floor mat can keep you just as warm as a sweater. Maps, plastic bags, newspapers, even a sunshade can provide critical layers of insulation to get you through a cold night. For more winter survival tips, go to weather.com slash commando. A frozen lake like this is a tempting sight for lots of cold weather fans, but this beautiful setting can turn deadly with a single misstep. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. You should never walk on ice that's less than four inches thick. And even then, here in North America, there's no such thing as safe ice. Ice that is black, blue, or green in color is considered strong, but white or opaque ice means that water has melted or refrozen several times and is much less stable. As the old saying goes, thick and blue, tried and true. Thin and crispy, way too risky. But what should you do if you should ever fall through the ice? First, don't panic. Even if you're only wearing a winter jacket, its buoyancy should help you stay afloat for at least a few moments. Position yourself to face the strongest part of the ice. If you have a knife or even a set of keys in your pocket, use it to dig into the ice. Reach your hands and arms as far as possible to stretch out on the unbroken ice next to you. Kick your legs and feet vigorously as if you were swimming. Then use your arms and elbows to push yourself out of the hole. When you're on the surface, quickly roll away from the hole. This distributes your weight more evenly, decreasing the possibility of breaking through the ice again. Do not stand up until you are clear of the hole. At this point, warm up and get help. You need to get out of your wet clothes as soon as possible. Hypothermia usually takes a while to set in, but it's critical to get warm fast. For more cold weather survival tips, go to weather.com slash commando.
Hi, Dr. Marcus here. There's nothing like getting away from it all to enjoy some beautiful weather in the great outdoors. What if your getaway goes wrong and you find yourself lost in the wild? It's essential for survival to stay hydrated. The average person can go three weeks without food, but only three days without water. No matter where you are, whether it's hot or cold, there's a good chance you can always find water. If you're near trees, let them pump moisture from their roots underground right up to you. Take a plastic bag tied around a leafy branch. A shoestring makes a handy rope. Then wait a few hours. Evaporation from the leaves will produce drinkable condensation inside the bag. Even if you're lost in a hot, arid desert, there should be water sources nearby. Green vegetation in this dry riverbed is a good sign. Dig below and you might find water. You can also build a solar still and let the sun help you collect water. Dig a hole and place a cup inside. Lay a piece of plastic or even your raincoat over the hole. Use a rock to make a cone over the cup. The sun's heat will produce water vapor that will condense under the plastic and slowly fill the cup. And water collected from a solar still is pure enough to drink. For more wilderness survival tips, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. If you've gotten lost while you're out enjoying the weather, knowing which direction you're heading can bring you to safety. But what if you forgot your compass? You can make an emergency compass. First, use a small piece of metal like a paper clip and magnetize it by rubbing it against your clothing. Break off a small piece and embed that into a stick. Drop the stick in very still water, the metal end will rotate and point towards magnetic north. To find east and west, you can also determine direction from the shadow of an upright stick. Follow the shadow and put a second stick at the tip. Wait 30 minutes, then place a stick in the tip of the second shadow. Draw a line between the points and you have the directions of east and west. And just like on a map, that's south and this direction is north. And when the sun goes down, look to the stars. In the northern hemisphere, seek out the north star, Polaris. It's the last star in the handle of the Little Dipper. If you have trouble finding it, the Big Dipper is usually easy to spot, and you can use it as a guide. The two stars at the front of the cup form a line that points to the north star, Polaris. Then draw an imaginary line from the north star down to the horizon, and that direction indicates north. For more navigation techniques, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. You're out camping, the sky suddenly darkens, and you hear thunder. You could be in danger of a lightning strike. Lightning storms are one of nature's most spectacular shows. They're also one of the most lethal. If you see lightning and can hear thunder within 30 seconds of the flash, you should seek shelter immediately. A sturdy building or a hardtop car is best. If you're stuck out here like I am, this is how to save your life. Get away from any metal objects, including your backpack or tent. Lightning is attracted to the tallest object, so move from higher to lower elevations. 
do not seek shelter under an isolated tree. But if you're in a wooded area, get under a canopy of many trees at the same height, as these won't offer a single target. But if you're caught in the open, your skin starts tingling, or you sense your hair standing on end, you are in danger. Lightning may be about to strike. Immediately drop into the lightning crouch. It looks much like a baseball catcher. Put your feet together, squat down, lift your heels, and tuck your head. Cover your ears and close your eyes to minimize blindness and deafness caused by a nearby strike. Never lie flat on the ground, as that exposes your heart to current running through Earth. When the immediate threat of lightning has passed, cautiously head to the safest spot possible, but don't resume normal activity for at least 20 minutes after the last flash or rumble. For more on lightning storm safety, go to weather.com slash commando. One of the most inspiring moments for sky watchers is spotting a shooting star. What looks like a star falling from the sky is actually a meteor, a small bit of rock that burns up as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. The pieces that survive to hit the ground look like this and are called meteorites. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. Meteor showers come at regular points during the year, like any event caused by the Earth's orbit. Most meteors come from debris shed by comets as they orbit the sun. If the Earth travels through the debris stream, we can see a meteor shower. If you want to find a meteorite, take a magnet and tie it to a string. Go hike through a spot where cars can't reach. Drag that magnet behind you, and the pieces of metal the magnet collects are mostly micrometeorites and can be millions of years old. To observe the skies, astronomers use giant telescopes like this one. But if you want to see a meteor shower, you don't need any special equipment. Try to get away from brightly lit areas, from city light, street lights, or even headlights from oncoming cars. An open area in a state park can be a good choice. Once you've found a good spot, let the sky and stars fill your field of view. While you don't need a telescope, using a red filtered flashlight allows you to read a star chart without losing your night vision. That's it. Just sit back and enjoy the show. For more information on meteor showers, go to weather.com slash commando. A sunny day is a great time to be outdoors, but you may find you're not the only one enjoying the scenery. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. Weather changes can increase the number of insects in your neighborhood. Warm, sunny days, especially after rain showers, can trigger swarming insects like bees to head out and start a new colony. Should you ever encounter a hive, don't disturb it. Bees only sting when they sense a threat, so don't make sudden movements. Stay calm and slowly move away. But if you accidentally step on a swarm or provoke an attack, cover your head and run for shelter. Getting into water is not a good escape plan. The bees won't follow you in, but they will wait for you to come up for air. An enclosed car or building is a safer choice. If you are far from shelter, try to run through tall brush. If you should get stung, the bee will die, but the stinger can continue to pump venom for up to 20 minutes, so remove it as soon as you can. A good way to remove it is to gently scrape it out with a flat edge or a fingernail. A paste of baking soda and water, or even wet mud, helps relieve swelling. If you have multiple stings, 
or the swelling expands beyond the sting area, or you think you may be allergic, seek medical attention as soon as possible. For more about insect swarms, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here, taking advantage of a wind tunnel to experience a few moments of flight. It takes 120 miles per hour of wind speed to keep me off the ground. That's equal to an EF2 class tornado. It doesn't take much more than that to send your car flying down the street. The most violent tornadoes can level and blow away almost any house, but most tornadoes can be survived by following some basic precautions. If you see a dark, sometimes greenish sky, be on alert. A low-hanging, rotating cloud often spawns a tornado. If you're on the road, vehicles are extremely dangerous in a tornado. You can be swept up and tossed about. Never try to outrun a tornado, as it's too hard to tell which way it's moving. If a funnel cloud is visible, immediately park and get out of your car. Try to seek shelter in a sturdy building. The general rule is go low and get low. Crouch down and make as small a target as possible. A bathtub or closet may offer a shell of partial protection. But if an open country, run to low ground or a ditch. Lie flat and face down, touching the back of your head with your arms. Don't seek shelter under a bridge. Debris flying underneath could be deadly. You are safer in a low, flat location. Hopefully, with these precautions, your only flights will be planned ones. For more tips on tornado safety, go to weather.com slash commando. Hi, Dr. Marcus here. Whenever you're out enjoying nature, try to avoid a close encounter with this guy. This is poison oak. This plant and its cousins, poison ivy and poison sumac, are the most common sources of allergic reactions in the country. The cause behind these nasty rashes, blisters, and that infamous itch is arushiol, a chemical in the sap of all three plants. Brushing up against one of them will leave most people in pain. If you think you've had contact with these poison plants, don't delay. Immediately wash all exposed areas. If you can do this within five minutes, the water might keep the arushua oil from contacting your skin and spreading to other parts of your body. Your goal is to remove the sticky resin-like substance that causes the rash, especially off your hands. Your best form of protection is to learn to recognize these plants. Poison ivy usually grows east of the Rocky Mountains and most commonly appears as a vine. Each leaf has three leaflets. The leaves are green in the summer and red in the fall. Poison oak grows as a low shrub, a six foot tall clump or a vine up to 30 feet long. It too has three leaves per cluster. The reason for the phrase, leaves of three, let them be. Unfortunately, that expression doesn't work for poison sumac. Its leaves have 7 to 13 leaflets, but it's usually only found in peat bogs or swamps, so watch where you're waiting. If unattended, the rash and itch normally disappears in two to three weeks, but with a little foresight, you'll enjoy the outdoors a whole lot more. For more on poison plants, go to weather.com slash commando.
Hi, Dr. Marcus here, taking in some fresh ocean air. Piers like this one can be one of the most popular ways to take in the view. But sadly, beneath the surface, this can be one of the most polluted points along the coast. Here, I'll show you. One of the most common causes of wildlife entanglements is fishing line that sportsmen lose or toss off the pier. Once entangled, a fish can rarely free itself and it often attracts other wildlife to the same hazard. In fact, the area underneath the pier is a toxic zone of junk often innocently dropped by visitors. A cell phone will corrode and release chemicals, and these plastic materials never completely break down. All this debris kills marine life, including the ones we eat. So when you're out enjoying the view, make sure you're not hurting it. One way to keep fishing line out of the water is to make a recycling container. Like this one, you can make one with some pipe from your local hardware store and a couple of bungee cords. After obtaining permission from the local authority, install containers like these at popular fishing spots. And then, every few weeks, take the used fishing line to a monofilament recycling center. So remember to watch your gear on the pier because what you lose above will cause a bigger loss below. For more information about keeping our oceans clean, go to weather.com slash commando. If you get stranded or lost in a snowstorm, one thing you can do to help you survive is build a fire. Look for a place to start a fire that's protected from the wind. You should always carry waterproof matches or a plastic lighter. But if you don't have them, believe it or not, you can start a fire with just a few sticks and your shoestring. First, gather dry wood. To find it, look for dead lower branches and bark from the underside of trees. Then build a base for your fire using a large piece of wood, say three or four inches in diameter, to keep the fire off the snow. This piece can be damp. Notch a hole in it. Then wrap a shoestring around a single stick to make a bow. And you get your shoestring back later, don't worry. You need some dry material for tinder, like wood shavings from tree bark, paper from a book, or even lint from your pocket. Vigorously bow the stick until the friction lights the fire. Then add progressively larger pieces of wood to the flame. You can also use the fire to melt snow. A damp piece of wood can be made into a cup. Eating cold snow can lower your body temperature and increase your risk of hypothermia. If you should get lost in the wild, it's essential to stay hydrated. No matter where you are, there's a good chance you can always find water. You can use your clothes to collect moisture. Tie clean socks around your legs and walk through dew-soaked grass or brush. Then wring them out. You can even use a sock to soak up moisture from a hollow in a tree. The water you collect will be brown from tannins in the wood. In other words, it's just like tea.